chance of hanging half a hundred on them at Owen Field. Or the run rules on the Diamond at Love's Field. We're giving you the breakdowns, the bets, and the hot takes from the perspective of two former OU Athletics employees. You're listening to the Mainline Podcast with Tyler Burton and Adam Jaquez. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go. It's the Mainline Podcast. I'm Adam Jacquez. He's Tyler Burton. Special episode of the Mainline. We don't always go live on YouTube, but uh, some big news as Seth Luttrell and Joe John Finley are named offensive coordinator of the Oklahoma Sooners, or I guess co-offensive coordinators, uh, first reported by Soonerscoop.com. Tyler, welcome in. How are you doing this evening? I'm good, Adam. We don't always live stream, but sometimes special occasion requires the circumstances, so we are going live this evening. Huge credit. Uh, shout out to the Sooners Group crew, George Stoya, Kerry Murdoch, Eddie Radosevich. Been on top of this thing from day one. Uh, breaking the news tonight that Joe John Finley and Seth Luttrell are going to be the new co-offensive coordinators at the University of Oklahoma for the foreseeable future, uh, a deal that is being finalized as we speak. Hopefully we've got the full details of that contract within the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. But yeah, Adam, we we kind of we knew that we were going to be recording tonight, typical Tuesday episode, and then uh, we had a script. We had we kind of had an itinerary, some things we wanted to cover, a lot of outside hire uh, conversation. And then here in a matter of about a half hour, that just kind of gets ripped up into shreds. And uh, here we are talking about the uh, the two new co-offensive coordinators at Oklahoma. Crazy times. It kind of felt like this was always going to be inevitable is kind of the end result was just go internally, hire some guys that had a lot of experience. Maybe they're not the most flashy. Maybe they don't have the biggest name. I mean, it's not like tons of other teams were looking for an offensive coordinator and had Seth Luttrell <laughs> at the top of their list, but he's still a guy that has a lot of experience and we'll go through some of that here in a second. But yeah. Tyler, just initial thoughts off the bat. And if you're watching live on YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, would love to have your comment as well. Like what grade are you giving this hire of Seth Luttrell co-offensive coordinator with Joe John Finley? Well, Adam, let's back up a second here. Um, you know, let, let's get into this because I think that this conversation is fascinating. And, you know, let's look at this, starting with Brent Venables and all that he's had to deal with since he kind of took over the job, the roster turnover, changing the culture, rebuilding the coach and staff, all the stuff that happened with Kale's dismissal. Uh, and, you know, Brent Venables, after Jeff Levy, you know, d making the decision to take the Mississippi State job, kind of found himself in a position where, you know, this is arguably the biggest coaching decision that he's going to, probably has made in his entire career, both as a as a defensive coordinator, but also now as a head coach. When you look at the trajectory and where this program is headed going into the SEC with a brand new starting quarterback in Jackson Arnold. And, you know, with this defense still being a work in progress, you had to absolutely nail this hire. Um, and, you know, this brings me to the question that we've been debating since Levy announced that he was taking the Mississippi State job on Sunday, and that was would Brent choose to promote from within, to keep the continuity within the football team, within the recruiting, uh, the recruits for 2024 and 2025, or do you possibly look to make a decision to bring in an outside hire? Now, I think that this this was probably a very complex, tough decision that Brent kind of battled with for you know two to three days. You know, when you look at what he currently has on the staff with Seth Luttrell, offensive analyst, you know, former offensive coordinator at multiple different places, has the head coaching experience from North Texas. You pair that with Joe John Finley, uh, who was, you know, kind of the uh, the on-field signal caller for Jeff Levy the last couple of seasons. He's got some experience. And then, you know, they, they've got experience working with current players on the team. They already had relationships developed with the 24 and 25 guys. And this was probably, Adam, a, a hire that was made based on continu continuity. It was a way to keep a lot of the players that are currently on this team in Norman, and it's also a way to probably you know do the best possible job at this point of keeping that 2024 class together uh, as we uh, come up here on early signing day, less than a month from now. But um, it's we can we can kind of peel the layers back on it. I'm not super high on it. Uh, to, to be quite honest with you, is it probably the right decision to make for where this program is at right now? Yes, possibly because you want to do each and everything you know in your power to keep this uh, this collection of talent, the, you know these recruits and everything together. Jackson Arnold was probably one of the ultimately the biggest deciding factors in this. What did we need to do to ensure that Jackson Arnold stays at the University of Oklahoma along with a guy like Michael Hawkins in the upcoming class? Um, but if I'm being honest, Adam, I was 
kind of in the camp where I was wanting an outside hire. We had a few guys that we know that Oklahoma was interested in. Some conversations had been had. And I just kind of get the impression that maybe we settled in, in this case. And that's not something that I'm used to saying in a place like at Oklahoma. You know, the offensive coordinator job at the University of Oklahoma, Adam, is one of the premier coordinator jobs in college football. And it has been for, you know, the better part of two decades. Uh, you know, we've heard the stat going around that since the Bob Stoops era, every offensive coordinator that has, you know, been at the University of Oklahoma has gone on to a head coach. And, you know, you're going to have your pick of the litter and candidates are going to be expressing their interest on wanting to come, you know, call plays at OU going into the SEC. And I know the safe bet was was to promote Seth and to promote Joe John. And, you know, time remains uh, to, to be seen on whether or not, uh, you know, how good of a hire that this is and how good of a coaching decision it is. But I'll turn this back over to you, Adam. Brent Venables knew when he hired Jeff Levy, you know, two years ago, that this was something that he was going to have to be ready for. He needed to have a contingency plan in place. That's why Seth Luttrell was brought in as a defensive analyst a year ago. That way, in a moment like this where Jeff Levy does decide to take another job, he's got somebody that he can plug and play right there that's got the ties to the state of Texas, is familiar with the system, and he already has a relationship with the guys on campus. So am I a fan of it? Wouldn't be my first choice in the world, but hey, it's what we got. Jimmy in the live chat giving a C plus to the higher. I think I'm a little bit higher than that. I'd probably go like just a solid B. It's it's not exciting. It's not really all that sexy. I know that Latrell's not, you know, he hasn't been an offensive coordinator since 2015. That was the last time he actually mm -hmm. was solely an offensive coordinator and calling plays. Uh, at North Texas, he kind of did a little bit of, of play calling, a little bit of, you know, I know he had a heavy influence with the offense there. But I, I think I would kind of agree with that as far as like, well, I guess I, I'll say this. I don't think that we were in danger of losing any commits, really. I mean, we lost Dozy. I don't know if that really had anything to do with the offensive coordinator. It's unclear to me. I, I don't think he's a big piece, really, uh, necessarily. He's, I think he's somewhat replaceable. Nice guy. I'm sure he'll have success wherever he goes. But receivers of that level are kind of a dime a dozen. So I'm not too worried about that. Uh, but I think this is kind of like the Clemson model. Like, there's there's continuity here. You're promoting from within. He's a guy that has a lot of experience. He's going to have the best players he's ever had as an offensive coach. So mm -hmm. I think there's reason to be optimistic and to like some of the things that he's done in the past. Joe John Finley is kind of an interesting one. Uh, Sean in the in the chat here saying, you know, can we get more <laughs> than one elite tight end out of Joe John Finley? Which I think is an interesting point because he's a guy that's now the co-offensive coordinator. I don't know if that was a move made to keep him from going to Mississippi State, but to this point so far, Joe John Finley, I, I don't know, like... Mm. I don't know what he did to really earn that role necessarily. Am I am I crazy or am I bashing him too much? I don't think you're crazy, but I, I think that you also have to be very realistic that this was a this was a hire that was made. Yes, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of potential. Obviously, Brent Venables, you know, he has a vision, he has a plan, he sees something in both uh, Seth Lattell and Latrell and Joe John Finley to where he would choose to make the decision, mostly for probably continuity purposes, keeps everybody intact, but. You know, Adam, this was a situation where, again, I, I I know that with the transfer portal opening up here on December 4th, I know that with early signing day coming up here in just a few weeks, obviously a decision like this had to get done. You know, we had a whole list of candidates that we thought, you know, Oklahoma would at least take somewhat of a serious look at, but then you start going down some of the things that happened today. Sean Lewis takes the job. Matt Wells is being interviewed uh, for another position. And then some of the other candidates that we'll touch on here in just a little bit uh, was something that I really think OU had a you know, a serious opportunity in terms of being able to bring them in on campus. But then if, you know, if you do bring in an outside hire, <clears throat> you know, do you risk, you know, kind of the, the ship going off course, obviously with your recruiting classes, do you lose Jackson Arnold? <clears throat> do you lose some of the other position coaches in that, uh, in that coaching office right now by bringing in an outside hire that's got different opinions, different views, different schematics. Um, but no, I'm, I, I don't think I would give it a C, but I'm definitely not giving it any more, uh, than a B minus. Let's talk about some of those outside hires. Uh, Sean mentioned two names here in the live chat that we've been thinking about Willie Korn at Liberty and yep. then uh, Brennan Marion over at UNLV. Uh, you know, those guys are at group of five schools. I think some people will just turn their nose up to that and go, Oh, they don't play anybody. Well, the fact of the matter is UNLV recruits players that are at similar nature to all the other teams they play. Same thing mm -hmm. for Liberty. Um, I, and so I actually tweeted out from my personal account about Willie Korn the other day. Got a lot of positive feedback. Um, more that's, positive that's... feedback about him than we mm -hmm. saw from the mainline's account uh, for Brendan Marion, which I thought was kind of surprising because 
Uh, a lot of people just don't watch Liberty. Um, full transparency, like I went to school at Liberty, so I watched mm -hmm. a lot of Liberty games. Uh, so I'm a little bit more familiar with that offense, and uh, mm -hmm. I liked what they did there. But um, I don't know. It, it didn't seem like anyone outside got consideration for this role. Do you think that was maybe a mistake? I think potentially it was, but you have to kind of go back to the timeline. How soon did Brent want to get this done? Obviously, with like with what we've talked about, things that are coming down the pipeline. And you know, Adam, when we've asked the question well, on Twitter, let me, let me ask about that though. Like, does it need to be done already? Because I don't think there were very many guys that were considering decommitting. There's really no targets out there that mm -hmm. you need to lock in. So, mm -hmm. what was the urgency for? Well, and that's kind of the, that's kind of the million dollar question is why was there such a huge rush to get something like this done? And again, I know that Brent did his due diligence. He had a list going into this. He had a plan in place even before Levy signed the contract to go to Starkville. So I'm not I'm not knocking Brent on that. Uh, but you know, we, we asked the question to Adam on Twitter, and we talked about it. You know, ultimately amongst us, uh, nonstops and Sunday. And it's you know now that there is going to be a new coordinator or coordinators in Norman, what do we want the off the Oklahoma offense to look like going into the the SEC and how would that ultimately play into the selection of a new offensive coordinator? And, you know, Adam, we've been very fortunate and at times often spoiled at Oklahoma when it comes to offense. And, you know, when you look at the last 20 years, some of the guys that have came through this, this program, you know, just, at the, just on the offensive side of the football, Bradford, Peterson, Murray, Mayfield, you know, Hertz, Williams, Broyles, Lamb, it goes on and on. And since Baker Mayfield walked on campus in 2015, eight years ago, this has been the best offensive college football program in America, bar none. You, there's, you cannot re refute that. You cannot argue that consistently from top to bottom and for the better part of the last decade. Now we're in a situation going into a new conference with a soon-to-be two new co-offensive coordinators, and we're going to need to figure out what our offensive identity is, and we'll touch on kind of the – the Seth Luttrell air raid, how that kind of compares to what Joe John Finley being an Art Bryles guy coming from that, you know, Art Bryles tree in terms of that offensive scheme. We'll touch on that here in a minute. But, you know, you're going into a conference where the level of physicality is greater. The talent and athleticism of players is much higher and you have to be able to dominate in the trenches or this league will suffocate you. And now I know we're coming off, coming off of a regular season where we were top three offense, but to me, Oklahoma needed to tweak some things philosophically, I think, for us to be in a better position to have more sustained success like we've seen in the Big 12 for the better part of the last 20 years going into this new conference. So if you were asking me, Adam, what were some of the things that I was truly going to value, put you know a lot of emphasis in when uh, looking for a new offensive coordinator or co-OCs, it came down to, one, being a proven play caller, Joe John Finley, not a lot of experience. I don't know, really. I think that, you know, Jeff Levy was the primary play caller. Uh, obviously, you know, Joe John had a lot of input and, in, you know, putting game plans together, seeing things down their field level. But, uh, you know, if you've been out of the game for a while or you just haven't called plays in seven years like Seth the Trail has, then I'm sorry. At Oklahoma going into the SEC, that's kind of a red flag for me. So, number two for me, he's got to be an elite recruiter. Um, I'm sorry. Neither one of those guys being my kind of my closer. My OC being the guy that, you know, when it comes down to that final conversation with mom or dad or with that that elite recruit that you got to come in, you got to get those guys to be competitive in this league. Not the sexiest hire, in, in my opinion, whatsoever between those two. Now, again, you've, you've got to be able to recruit at all three levels. Ultimately, time will tell on how good of a decision this was. And then num number one, the number three for me, He's got to be a quarterback coach. And at the absolute worst, he needs to be an above average quarterback coach. This goes for everyone in college football, but especially when we're about to have a highly talented young guy, true sophomore, who's really only experienced Adam this year where the bullets were flying in meaningful reps, was a second half in Provo. Um, but again, going into the SEC where the pressure's higher, the, uh, uh, the, the reads are quicker, the game moves faster. Um, I thought that you needed to bring in an, an offensive coordinator that has the ability to, to coach his quarterback, help him progress as a player. Um, and I hate to bring the name up, Adam, but you got to give credit where credit's due. The guy was damn good at it. You know, Lincoln Riley had the ability with his quarterbacks in Norman where if he wasn't playing well, if something, if something was wrong schematically, maybe he was struggling in between the ears during the course of the game. Lincoln had a way of calming his guys down and being able to put them in positions where they could get into a rhythm uh, and find success. And, you know, you think about Baker in the second half in Knoxville. You think about Jalen Hurts in Waco in the second half, down 28-3. to three. Caleb in the Cotton Bowl. Kyler and Lubbock in the second half. 
you have to be the you have to be that go-to person for your quarterback, someone that he can rely on when the water gets choppy. And I'm sorry, but Seth Luttrell and Joe John Finley are two guys whose background is mainly focused in the tight end room. So it is going to be a little bit of a learning curve. Seth Luttrell, obviously, uh, from what Sooner Scoop uh, reported, he is going to take the lead in the quarterback coaching uh, for Jackson Arnold and the rest of the guys in that quarterback room. But um, again, I I probably would have gone the outside higher. There's a few more things that I kind of put emphasis on. But like I said, Brent's got a plan. We'll see what happens. Yeah, Seth Luttrell's never coached the quarterback position uh, nope. until now, I guess. I assume he's going to be the quarterback's coach because that – position is open and mm-hmm. there's no more room to put anyone else on there. So, uh, um, and you, you let, brought up, you brought up Mason fine at North Texas, put up yeah. great numbers. Good so. player, yeah. Um, now Seth Luttrell does have some experience recruiting. Mitch Trubisky is a recruit of his at UNC. Now he didn't coach him the final year before he went pro. Um, but he was, he was mm-hmm. on the roster there, um, signed by Seth Luttrell as the offensive coordinator there. So, you know, that there's something there. I know Trubisky gets made fun of a lot for his NFL career, but was a very good uh, college quarterback still. Um, you mentioned the uh, what we tweeted out earlier about, like, what do we want this offense to look like heading into the SEC? Yeah. And I'll highlight just one response that we got on there that I thought was really, it was like, yep, I agree with that 100%. Uh, widget underscore Brian, two words, methodical, I guess, and or identifiable. And I think that's where I, we... You know, something we've talked a lot about with Jeff Levy was we didn't really know what we were going to get week to week. We saw something one week. We didn't never saw it again. You know, there's just no consistency to that. Uh, consistency was another word that came up a lot in the responses that we got on Twitter of what we wanted mm-hmm. that offense to look like. I think Latrell, being more experienced, <laughs> being a head coach, I think he'll have an opportunity to be more successful along those lines there. And I think... You know, some of the guys that I like, like Willie Korn, for example, from Liberty, I think he would have brought like a smash mouth yet explosive offense to Norman. And I think Luttrell can do some things along those lines. I don't know necessarily that it will be. I mean, he had a lot of offenses where he rushed for over 200 yards a game, which is great. I think Levy really needed some help in the running game department. It was yeah. more simple and just, <clears throat> hey, we're going to line up fast and try to uh, surprise you with zone uh, blocking schemes. It just really didn't work at the end of the day. So Mm-hmm. I'm hopeful for Latrell, but overall, like, yeah, it's it's hard to be super, super excited about it. it it's going to be an interesting merger, and it's going to be really exciting to cover this and figure out if this is a if this is a marriage that can possibly work between these two. Because, like I said, Lebby was a true R. Bryle system, and that's where Jeff Lebby, or and that's where Joe John Finley, that's where his background kind of comes from. And you know, in the R. Bryle system, where the staple is kind of the deep choice concept, where you know, whichever receiver they call the deep choice to, he either has the option of a go route or a curl, a post. And if it's to the slot receiver, he can also run an out. There's a lot of repetition uh, in practice that has to be done by your quarterbacks and your wide receivers to make sure that everybody is on the same page. You're seeing things consistently from top to bottom and everything else kind of builds off that. And, you know, Levy's run system was a lot of go, uh, a lot of zone scheme, a lot less GT counter, more gap scheme type things. Whereas you look at what Seth Luttrell likes to do, and obviously we'll have a lot of time this offseason to really kind of dive into this a little bit more in the X's and O's as far as what Seth likes to do. Um, but it is true air raid. Adam, make no mistake about it. There are some choice concepts, but usually in an air raid offense, the choice routes are more basic, more decisions are made pre-snap. Uh, by the quarterback based off what the defense is showing you. But then Air Raid Latrell runs that you know type of schematic. It's going to be a mixture between kind of the Leech Kingsbury that we've grown so accustomed to seeing with some West Coast variances to basically get the ball out of your hands quicker. Uh, you know, some of those, you know, uh, quick, there's not going to be any five-step drops, any things like that. It's going to be snap, boom, got it, get it out, get it out fast. So you're going to see more diversity, I think, in the passing game with Seth Latrell. Um, and, you know, that's been something that's been talked about from a few different Oklahoma wide receivers in the last two or three years. And it was the lack of complexity within the different route structures. Marvin Mims had a phenomenal quote about that when he was going through the draft process a year ago. Um, you're going to see more formations with four wide receivers. And you're still something that I am excited about. And this is why it's going to be so nice if Oklahoma is able to gain the commitment and signature of Devon Mitchell. In an air raid type system that Seth Luttrell likes to run, you're still going to see a lot of 11 personnel group. You're going to see a lot of four wide receiver um, you know, formations across the board. And when the air raid system is at its best, Adam, 
is when you've got kind of a mismatch at the tight end position that can you can do a lot of things, especially over the middle of the field with. Um, and the run scheme is going to be the biggest thing that I will be looking for. And obviously, there's a lot of guys that know that have forgotten more about football than I could possibly ever know. I know Gabe Eichert's probably one. He's going to do a tremendous job of breaking down the run fits and kind of the scheme that Seth is going to bring to the table. But when you look at the air raid offense that Seth is going to be bringing to the table, <clears throat> I think the run scheme is going to be a lot more like what we saw with Lincoln Riley. It's going to be a lot of GT counter, basically you know, more of what we saw, kind of that marriage between Lincoln and Bill Beanbow back from 15 all the way up to 2021. You're still going to see some gap uh, some some gap type plays, but it's going to be more counter, more zone, more duo. Um, and something that I am excited, Adam, to throw this back over to you, I think you're going to see a lot more guard center combinations. You're going to – Oklahoma is going to get to the point of attack. They're going to get that line of scrimmage blocked up more securely because you're going to have two linemen essentially – starting out on a on a defensive tackle, and then one guy is going to work his way up to that second level. And that's something that really Oklahoma fans, we noticed for a majority of this season was, okay, offensive line didn't really move too many guys around, but once the running back was able to make it into the second level with the running backs, with the widers, or with the uh, uh, safeties, they were really kind of in a position where it was on them to make those guys miss. Whereas I think some of the things that Seth and Joe John are going to be able to merge together, you're going to create a lot more space for your running backs to make plays once they get past that initial level. I agree. I, I'm not inspired by the run schemes that we've seen over the last two no. years. And so uh, I'm hopeful that Seth Latrell, and we'll take a look at his offense. We've got some video lined up sure. of some of his offense uh, from UNC and from North Texas that we'll, we'll roll here in a second. And some of the stats and, and numbers behind his offenses and the success that he's had. Um, Let's get to know Seth Luttrell a little bit better. If you weren't already aware, he's the son of Jimmy Luttrell, former fullback of the Sooners. So father, son, both playing fullback for OU, both winning national championships. Uh, dad, Jimmy, won in 74 and 75. Then Seth Luttrell, of course, in 2000. Tyler, if you had a dad, which your dad, I believe, grew up during the Barry Switzer. Not if you had a dad. <laughs> yeah. You, of course, have a dad. But if you had a <laughs> I think, dad I think I in, do. <laughs> if you grew, had a dad that grew up in the Barry Switzer era, which I believe your dad did, Mm -hmm. What are you getting him for Christmas? What What's Seth Luttrell getting his dad for Christmas? Uh, I I have, I have no idea, Adam. It, possibly okay, some, it a, better it better it better be some red and west. That's, that's all I can was. say. That was a that's softball. all I can say. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's we're almost flipping the calendar into the month of December. Christmas is just a few weeks away. Obviously, Red and West, proud sponsor of the podcast. Love everything what those guys do over there on that website. The the content that they put out. The, the apparel that they've got, T-shirts, hoodies, hats, pullovers, anything and everything that you could imagine. We know the football season is winding down, but that men's basketball team, man, they are a lot of fun to watch coming out of the gate swinging. So get uh, get game day ready. Get some of that uh, that game day swagger. Get some of that apparel uh, and get your tails over to the LNC, watch some basketball. And get yourself ready for Diamond Sports coming up too, and there's no better place to shop for OU apparel than Red and West. Absolutely. Have tons of, uh, of retro gear. So I was like, yes, yeah, of course, that's going to be perfect for uh, for Seth's dad if he's looking perfect. for a Christmas gift. Probably perfect. perfect for a lot of people that are watching this that either grew up in that era or have a family mm -hmm. member that, that grew up in that era. Tons of cool stuff there. So make sure you check out Red and West. Now, let's take a look at Seth <clears throat> Luttrell's offense. Um, I'll go ahead and queue up the video here, but just sure. some numbers to kind of be aware of, I guess, with, uh, with Seth's offenses in the past. Of course, UNC, the last stop he had as an offensive coordinator uh, back in 2014-2015. Uh, they topped 40.7 times in that 2015 year. OU only topped 40 points five times that uh, this year here in 2023. So it, it, he ran a, a pretty good offense there, in my opinion. He ranked second in the country in his uh, final season there in yards mm -hmm. per play. Um, they were one of only 11 teams that rushed for 250 yards per game, or sorry, passed for 250 yards per game and rushed for 200 yards per game. We saw a lot of that balance uh, continue at North Texas. Uh, we saw a lot of those um, numbers uh, continue as far as like explosive scoring offenses. Now, I think it's harder to measure some of those statistics at North Texas because you are playing some power conference teams in your non-conference schedule. So you aren't going to have as big of a success if you're playing Texas or if you're playing Texas Tech, for example, in those first couple sure. games of the year. So take that with a grain of salt, but still having a lot of success there um, throughout his entire time. He was heavily involved in the offense as head coach. At times he was calling plays. At times it was the offensive coordinator's responsibility. So not completely on his shoulders, but you did see quite a bit of success across the board there. And then had a lot of players that you guys, uh, you know, 
I recognized, um, you know, just as a college football fan, but I'm sure a lot of fans recognize from NFL names like Elijah mm-hmm. Hood. Uh, we talked about Mitch Trubisky early, earlier, someone that he recruited. Mason Fine's a name there. Uh, Mac Hollins, uh, Nate Sudfeld, mm-hmm. Ryan Switzer. Um, so a lot of different guys there that uh, have had success in the, the Seth Luttrell offense throughout the years. Mm-hmm. Well, and the good part about the situation that Seth's going to be stepping into, you know, obviously he's been an offensive coordinator, Arizona, North Carolina, Indiana. Uh, you know, he he had his fair share of really good offenses when he was at North Texas for his head coaching stint. But this is going to be, you know, the best, this is going to be the best quarterback he's ever had play for him from a, from a uh, skill standpoint, best probably collection of offensive line talent, best set of playmakers out on the perimeter, but also in the backfield as well. So, uh, there's going to be a lot of fun tools that Seth is going to have at his disposal to work with, uh, and it's just going to be it's going to be a fun time to watch how um, you know the kind of the what's left over from the Levy system with Joe John obviously taking that co-offensive coordinator role, merging it with what Seth likes to do, some of his principles from the air raid. It's going to be a fun spring practice. It's going to be uh, there's going to be a lot of new uh, you know intricacies to this offense, and it's going to be fun to watch how these guys try to merge this thing together. Because like I said, um, you know, when you try to forecast what this is going to be, Adam, I think that from a positivity standpoint, if they can figure out a way, especially in the running game, and obviously Bill Beanball is going to be heavily involved in this, if they can figure out a way to do some of the things like we saw during the Lincoln Riley area where you had those Joe Moore Award type uh, offensive lines, you know, you had the P Rhines, the Mixons, the Andersons having those big games consistently throughout the year. If Oklahoma can get back to running the football that way in that conference we're going to next year, I think that this could possibly be a great merger uh, for, for these two guys. And it's something that Oklahoma fans should be excited about. Um, but there's going to be a deep learning curve. Um, and I'm excited to see uh, how this is going to go together. Another big talking point that people have been asking about in regards to Seth Luttrell and really mm-hmm. just in regards to who the new offensive coordinator would be and a big change they want to see going into next year is the tempo. I went back and I looked at, you know, how plays per game mm-hmm. statistics from when Seth was an offensive coordinator. North Carolina, mm-hmm. they averaged, or I think they were at 26 in the country and 111th uh, in the country respectively in plays per game. So a really wide variance there. And that same type of variance continued at North Texas. I saw it as high as second in the country in place per game, all the way down to like 100 uh, in the country in place per game. So all over the spectrum as far as that tempo. And I'm curious to see what that looks like, because I do think that we are going to get more of that, that power running type scheme that you've talked about. And I wonder what that balances balance looks like and does that make OU like the 15th best scoring offense in the country but their you know points per play is the same you know mm-hmm. top 10 elite or or something along those lines to where we have more complementary mm-hmm. balance yeah. between what offense is doing and what Brent Venable's vision is for the defense it's going to be interesting to see some of the philosophies one one of the things that these two guys try to do i mean take tempo uh, for instance, and that was one of the things that I wanted to see change a little bit going into the SEC, and that's less tempo. You look at some of the national championship caliber teams, they don't consistently have to run a, a no-huddle, 100-mile-per-hour offense. To me, tempo is a way uh, to either be an equalizer or it gives you the opportunity to create advantages against teams that have far better talent than you do. That's not what Brent Venables is trying to build here. Less tempo, slow it down, be more methodical like you alluded to, Adam. And one of the things that I do think is going to be a huge positive from uh, this Seth Luttrell air raid type offense is you're going to be more multiple. That goes for that goes for formations, that goes for personnel groupings, that goes for game plans. Your offensive identity, Adam, shouldn't change, but depending on the matchup that you have that week, you should be able to create different ways for your personnel to attack and find success against the opponent. You're not going to attack Alabama the same way that you'll be able to attack South Carolina or Ole Miss, just simply it's not going to happen. But you need a coach or coaches, as now we have two offensive coordinators, that have the ability to put the guys on his roster in positions where they can be successful no matter who they line up against. I don't care if it's Georgia. I don't care if it's Vandy. I think that these guys are going to have to figure out a way to put a plan in place together to where what they choose to run, who they choose to be offensively, and what their identity is. This is something that we can cater and kind of tweak a little bit week in and week out to where we can, you know, we can consistently find ways to find positive matchups for our playmakers uh, and find a way to score points uh, against this SEC schedule. It's going to be fascinating how these two guys, one has never called plays by himself. The other one hasn't called plays in seven years. 
Now you're going up against the Nick Sabans of the world, some of those defensive coordinators in the SEC. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Makes for a lot of fun uh, conversation during the offseason. There's going to be a lot of good storylines and talking points. We do need to talk a little bit about Tempo, someone that left town pretty quick, <laughs> Jeff Levy. Um, yeah. I, it's it's a few days removed. It was first reported, I think, by uh, Matt over at CrimsonCaptain.com. And if you haven't checked out his Discord, um, if you want to, I mean, it's like following all the drama on Twitter, but on steroids, essentially, uh, because you're getting stuff more in real time uh, from, yeah. from Matt and from <laughs> some others as well. So it's interesting sure. to follow what's going on there, the dynamics and some of the uh, info in regards to um, what, uh, you know, off inner office relationships of the coaching staff is kind of mm -hmm. what I've been enjoying on the Discord there. So check that out. But in regards to Jeff Levy, Mississippi State, let, let, I guess, let me ask you this. Is Mississippi State a better job mm -hmm. than Vanderbilt? Yes, by one slot. And Carter, we see, <laughs> Carter, we see your question in the chat here. We'll get to that here in just a second. Yeah, that's kind of the million-dollar question, Adam. Jeff Levy to Mississippi State, was this the right move for Jeff Levy? And, you know, I think that this was something Mississippi State probably targeted weeks, maybe even a month or two ago, even before they fired Zach Arnett. Adam, I think that they reached out to a few current sitting head coaches at other programs and didn't get the answers that they wanted in terms of their interest in Mississippi State. So that's when I think that they started to put some feelers out in the camps of guys like Jamie Chadwell, guys like Jeff Levy here in Norman, two of the best offensive masterminds in college football. And once Zach Selman saw that there was some seri serious interest uh, coming from the camp of Jeff, Le Jeff Levy, um, then I think it was just they moved on it, and it was just kind of a match made in heaven. Um, however, I will say I think that this hire is twofolded. One, I think that it's a great hire at the right time for Mississippi State. You're bringing in one of the hottest up-and-coming coaches in the industry. The production that his offenses, they, they speak for themselves. He can recruit elite quarterbacks, skill talent. Levy's going to figure out a way to score points in Starkville. I have absolutely no doubt about that. However, I don't think Starkville is really the place that Jeff Levy can go in and expect that after he gets this program going – that he's going to consistently be able to win eight, nine, ten games a year. But if he lights up the scoreboard, then it's an on-field product that uh, provides excitement for the fan base and it gets you know gets everybody on board with what Jeff Levy's doing. But on the flip side, Adam, and this goes back to your question, I know that this is a head coaching job in the SEC. Offers like that don't come around too often, but I think that Jeff Levy could have held out for something better. Just being completely honest with you. Yeah. In my well, you, opinion, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, you look at the history of Mississippi State. There's one coach in the last 60-plus years that mm -hmm. parlayed his job at in Starkville to a bigger job, and that's Dan Mullen, and that's it. Yeah. That's the entire list. <laughs> you, it, In my opinion, outside of Vanderbilt, Mississippi State is the worst job in the SEC. You look at just the last 20 years of their program, their overall record is 130 wins to 120 losses. You focus on just SEC conference play uh, as a whole, 62 wins to 100 losses, and they finished the season ranked in the top 25 just four times in the last 20 years. And like you said, Adam, two of those years were the Dak Prescott, Dan Mullen teams that we saw, uh, you know, that high powered offense up in Starkville. So, again, if Jeff Levy would have stayed at Oklahoma for one more season, maybe two with Jackson Arnold, I think he could have continued that level of production with this offense in the SEC. Then I think he could have been in line for you know, potentially jobs down the line that are a better fit for him. Places like Florida, where I think it's only a matter of time before they fire Billy Napier, or, or Arkansas when they fire Sam Pittman. Obviously, Bobby Petrino factors into that. We could have an entire different conversation on that if we wanted to. Or maybe down the line when Ole Miss, you know, uh, has to replace Lane Kiffin because he takes an Alabama job or maybe something a little bit bigger. But again, I don't think Mississippi State is a place where you can realistically expect to compete year in and year out, even with the playoff going from four to 12 teams, it's a bottom feeder job in that conference. But I will say this, it's a good fit for Jeff because that fan base doesn't have high expectations for that program. He's not going to be expected to come in and win nine, 10 games a year. He needs to be bowl eligible for each of his first couple of seasons, turn the roster over, change the culture. And then after that, you see where he can take it. But I think it's a great opportunity for Jeff we're obviously going to miss him in Norman, despite what a lot of the fans think. And I think Zach Selman made one fantastic hire here. I think Jeff could have waited just 24 hours, and he might have had a better opportunity in front of him at Houston. And I know Houston probably isn't going to pay as good as Mississippi State, but 
he's not looking at Mississippi State as here's where I want to coach for the rest of my career and I, I have yeah. national championship aspirations here. He's looking at sure. that saying, hey, I can go there, I can do well, I can parlay that into a bigger job. Houston's a much better suited program for that. Um, and a year from now, Baylor's not going to ever hire Jeff Levy because of the connection to Art Bryles, but something like that could have opened up. Maybe it's, I don't think TCU would fire Sonny Dykes uh, at that point, but something like that, that's a little bit more familiar territory, has a high level of potential of success mm -hmm. in a in a conference like the Big 12. You go take that job, and then suddenly maybe you're parlaying that into you know, LSU, Auburn, Tennessee, Oklahoma, something like that. Um, so I just wonder, I feel like he, he jumps ship a little bit too soon. Um, do you think maybe he was potentially nudged <laughs> to look for a new opportunity though? I don't think he was nudged on the OU side of things. I think if anything, the last couple of months have shown us that there's kind of been a little bit of, I don't want to say animosity is the right word, but you can definitely tell that things were a little shaky ever since the Art Bryles, you know, after the game that one night, he found his way onto the field. It kind of felt like the, the fan base from that point forward, they were just kind of looking for an excuse to get onto Jeff anytime something, you know, went wrong or anything like that. And again, make no mistake about it. Jeff Levy is one of the best, Play callers, one of the best offensive minds in college football. Oklahoma is in a worse position right now with Jeff Levy not a part of this staff than they were, you know, four days ago. Now, again, have we had conversations on this podcast? Have we had multiple uh, arguments going back and forth about some of the things that we wish Jeff Levy would have done differently? Yes, of course. Um, there's obviously, over the course of a game, there's five, six, seven, eight plays that he wishes he would have done differently, would have called something different. But you know, my my biggest gripe with Jeff, you know, in terms of his play calling was situationally, I think at times he kind of basically got too cute in a sense, whether it was up in Stillwater, whether it was up in Lawrence. And you can't tell me, you know, watching how productive Oklahoma's offense has been, you know, against West Virginia or just, you know, four days ago against TCU, you know, scoring 69 points. You watch the offensive output like that. You see how aggressive we were being. You saw how well we ran the football. What the hell were we doing in Stillwater and, and, and up in Lawrence? And obviously, that's why we're not playing in Arlington this upcoming weekend. Uh, and, I mean, you have nobody else to blame but the but the uh, team and the guy in the mirror. But, again, at the end of the day, I think Oklahoma is going to be okay. It's obviously not what you or I ultimately wanted. Um, but you know what? Brent's got a vision. He's got a plan. And this is what he thinks is best for what this program needs at this point in time, both with the current staff, the current players, and the incoming recruits. And uh, we'll see where it goes. And OU fans, like, root for Jeff Levy. The better success he has, the better that is for OU because uh, maybe Brent Venables decides to retire after year five, year six, mm -hmm. whatever. Who knows what happens? Or maybe he just he washes out. Maybe we have to fire him. Who knows sure. what the future holds? But you want as many OU guys out there having high levels of success so that mm -hmm. when you do need to hire someone, you have tons of options uh, to, to choose from there. So I'll sure. be rooting for Jeff Levy. I just, and I think OU will miss him. I think we'll start to realize how good of an offensive mm -hmm. coordinator he is now that he's not here. But um, I, I do think he could have held out for something uh, a little bit of in a better situation there. Uh, yeah. Just speaking in regards to the future and, and kind of Brent Venable's plan there, uh, Carter's question here in the live chat, basically, do we envision uh, our offense still being dominant in the SEC going forward? Um, which I, I guess that's a good question. Like we mm. were used to really high levels of play on offense, but now this is Brent Venable's after making some adjustments, being a head coach for two years, does, is he... Is he maybe looking for more balance? Does he dial things back, or is it still, you know, pedal to the metal there? Brent's got the program going in the right direction. It's heading on the right path, but we're still not there yet. And I think that it has less to do about coaching and it has more to do about the current makeup of the roster. And, and make no mistake about it, where this roster is currently on November 28, 2023, to where it is when Brent you know, signed the dotted line and took this program over, he has started the process of, of doing a complete roster changeover. He's started to change, the pro to change the culture of this program. But going into the SEC, Adam, you turn on the tape and you just watch some of these teams going up and down the field against one another – the, the defensive line is the big one for me. We don't have a single defensive lineman on our football team, especially on the interior, that I think would start or really even be in the 2D rotation at a place like Bama, Georgia, Tennessee, A&M for that matter. So you've got to continue to recruit. And Brent is proving that he is doing that, obviously with the power line guys that are coming in in the class of 24, 
your David Stones, Jane Jacksons, Nigel Smith, so on and so forth. So help is on the way, but unfortunately, and I and Oklahoma fans need to be very realistic about where we're at right now going into the SEC. If you're expecting Oklahoma to walk into that conference next year with that schedule that's been laid at our feet and think that we're just going to go in there and you know go nine and three or ten and two, I'm sorry, but you got another thing coming. That that is a schedule going into next season where again. We'll, we'll see what the roster looks like two months from now after the transfer portal stuff kind of dies down after signing classes are, are on the board. Maybe we'll feel differently, but that's a schedule next year, Adam, where if you can figure out a way to win win eight games next year, it's pretty damn good, I think. With the opponents that you've got on that schedule, I'm just saying you need to kind of recaliber, not saying your expectations, but you need to be more realistic about where this program currently is the depth and the talent is not where it needs to be to compete for a four-month season in this conference. It's getting there, though. We're making positive strides. Now it's on Brent and the rest of this coaching staff to use the next two to three months to continue to beef up this roster, particularly on the lines of scrimmage on both sides of the football, because that's ultimately going to dictate more so, I think, than coaching right off the bat, how competitive Oklahoma can be in the SEC going into 2024. I don't disagree with any point you just made there. I, I just, I can't lower my expectations. Like <laughs> I'm an Oklahoma fan. I want perfection. I want national championships every year. And, and that's I, the I'm standard. Not, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for this new era of college football of going nine and three and making the 12 team playoff and yep. that being a successful year. I'm, I'm just not, I'm not okay with that. I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to take a long time for me to adjust, I think. So um, we'll have lots of time in the off season to talk about SEC scheduling, all sorts of different things, expectations, and, and so forth. Um, but it's it's time for us to get to our our final hang on, segment. Hang on, hang on, hang on yep. one second, Adam. Do you see this being a long term solution, or do you think that this is kind of a stopgap? This is the plan in place to get us through the next year. We'll see how it goes, and then if things don't go according to plan, if it's apparent. That a, that a change needs to be made, then you possibly look at bringing in an outside hire from next year. Because I think you and I were in agreement. We had a guy picked out that we wanted to bring in that I think would be a fantastic position at the office of coordinator, which obviously that's out the window now. Um, do you think that this is something that's going to be a permanent thing going forward? Or is this kind of going to be a trial and error type situation for year one? I think Brent ideal scenario for him is Seth Luttrell is very good. He's top 15 offensive coordinator in the country. And at this point, wait, say, say career, that, say that one more time. Top 15. I think that's what ideal scenario is for Brent. He's, you know, he's a, he's a top 15 offensive coordinator is Seth Luttrell. And he's a guy that in this point in his coaching career is someone that will stick around, uh, for at Oklahoma, the way that we saw offensive coordinators at Clemson stick around. Is he top 15? I don't know. I don't think so. Not based on what I know right now, but I think that's ideal scenario for what Brent is envisioning and saying, Hey, he's someone that can be good, but will also stick around and, and there's value in that continuity. We'll see if that actually plays out. I, I have doubts, but who, who we'll did, see. who did you, who did you want? I was really, I was really liking Willie Korn uh, out of Liberty um, being a guy that I've watched a lot of his offense. And I know people will say, Oh, he didn't call the plays. Um, Jamie Chadwell called the plays and he called, so uh, he called, he called quite a few of them. He, I think he called quite a few of them, but also, mm -hmm. you know, Brent Venables didn't call plays before he became the full-time defensive coordinator at Oklahoma. Sure. So like <laughs> there are guys that do very well in their first situations mm -hmm. as play callers. It's, it's not something where you have to say, Oh, you have to learn somewhere else and then come to Oklahoma. Like, we have assistant coaches come and be head coaches here at Oklahoma all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with coordinators. Like they come, they play call or they play call plays here at Oklahoma for the first time and they have success. So it's really about identifying the right guy and bringing in the right offense in. But I did like what Liberty was able to do just to have mm -hmm. that smash, uh, smash mouth, um, but still explosive offense. So yep. uh, I liked what that was going on there. I think Seth Luttrell can bring some of those elements, but um, there's just not, not a lot of juice to it. And you know what? Maybe maybe the boring pick is the best pick. We'll find out. Time will tell. Um, and we'll get our first taste of that in the bowl game because I would imagine Seth just steps right in and starts calling plays. So, sure, we'll see. 
All right. It's going to be fun. One more week of college football with uh, the championship weeks. No OU game, but that doesn't stop us from our bets competition. We've got a, uh, a competition here between Tyler and I. If you're new to the Mainline podcast, we do it at the end of every episode, uh, basically outlining our five best picks for the upcoming week of games. This is our final week. Tyler has a one and a <clears throat> half game lead. Narrowed a little bit after my good week last week, but uh, still maintains a, a decent lead there. So, Tyler, uh, you're going to lead us off with your first pick of the week. Yeah, trying to close this thing out. It's like going to the 18 t box with a three-shot lead and just trying to figure out a way to not screw this thing up. So, pick number one for me, Adam. It is conference championship week. I'm going down to Arlington, Texas, Big 12 championship, Oklahoma State versus Texas. Longhorns favored by 14 and a half. Adam, this one is almost too sim- This one's almost too easy. It almost just feels like it's way too obvious of a cover. But at the end of the day, what's Oklahoma State's bread and butter? It's Ollie Gordon. It's running the football. What's the best thing that Texas does defensively? It's stopping the run with the front seven. I'm not going to overthink this. Texas covers the 14 and a half, and uh, they run Oklahoma State out of the stadium on Saturday. I do need to be- make up some ground on you, so I am going to go opposite on this one. OSU plus 14 and a half. I. It's the typical Mike Gundy situation here where I just look at this game and go, I don't think that they're going to be able to play with Texas. I don't think it's going to be close. I don't want to root for Oklahoma State to to win this bet necessarily. I don't want to root for Texas either. But when when Gundy is going one direction, I feel like it's always, you know, the, the media, the fans are going the other direction. So that's kind of what I'm betting on here is just Oklahoma State plays out of their mind. They play up to their competition. They keep it close. Uh, so I'll take the Cowboys to cover the 14 and a half there. Pick number two. Nice. Tyler. Pick number two for me going up to the SEC. In, Yep. Pick number two for me going to Atlanta, Georgia versus Alabama. Georgia currently favored by six and a half. And, you know, Adam, I know that I'm not going to overthink this one either. I mean, Alabama, I know that they are a one-loss team. I know that they did complete that miracle at Jordan Hare a week ago, but let's not forget about it. Alabama was struggling late into the second half. Auburn lost that game. They figured out a way to choke it up and give it back to Alabama. So, again, Georgia – they're on fire right now, man. The fact that I can get this under a touchdown, give me the dogs to cover the six and a half. My number two, I'm going to uh, Florida State minus two and a half against Louisville in the ACC championship game. Um, I know the Knowles have their backup QB, but I think across the board, every other position, I think Florida State just has a huge talent advantage there. So uh, I'm going to take the Knowles to, uh, to win by more than a field goal. Very nice. Pick number three for me, Friday night in the Pac-12 out in Las Vegas, Oregon versus Washington. Oregon currently a nine-and-a-half point favorite. Adam, this one's pretty scary because I haven't heard one single person, whether it's in the media, whether it's on social media, outside of the Washington fanboys, that actually think that Oregon is not going to win this game. So, again, I do think that Oregon is ultimately going to win this thing, but nine and a half is a little bit too rich for me. Washington's going to figure out a way to stay within that number. The defense is going to play uh, pretty well. They will figure out a way to keep this thing under double digits. So for that reason, while I think the Ducks win it, Washington's going to cover the nine and a half. I wanted to pick that one, but I need to stay a little bit different than you. Uh, My number three, App State traveling to Troy. Uh, Take on the Trojans there. I'm taking the under 52 and a half. Troy, one of the top 10 uh, defenses in the nation in in scoring defense. And so um, I think this will be a little bit lower scoring. Uh, I think Troy actually pulls this one out uh, pretty handily. I like it. Pick number four for me going out to Indianapolis. Big 10 championship, Michigan versus Iowa. Probably the biggest snooze fest of the weekend with what that's expected to be. I'm going to take Michigan first quarter minus six and a half here. I think seven points honestly might be enough for Michigan to win this thing. I think they're going to jump jump on Iowa early. Iowa's kind of been flirting with death um, all season long. I think Michigan's going to run away with this one. They're going to jump on the Hawkeyes right from the opening kickoff. Give me, uh, give me the Wolverines minus six and a half first quarter. I'm going to the MAC championship game for my number four, Miami of Ohio plus seven and a half versus Toledo. That game being played in Detroit. These two teams played a couple of weeks back, a four point win for Toledo. Uh, at uh, Miami, actually. So um, going on the road spread is a little bit higher, but I think Red Hawks will have enough to uh, keep it close with uh, the Rockets there. I like it. Pick number five for me. This is not one that I feel good about, but there's only so many games this weekend, so we're just going to roll with it. SMU versus Tulane. It looks like the line on this, Adam, what is it, SMU plus four and a half? 
Is that what we've, what we've got it at right now? That's what it is last I checked. I'll, I'll double check while you're you're uh, going through that. Okay, thing. according to fan, I, I love me some Michael Pratt. I love what uh, uh, what Tulane is doing. The uh, the job that Willie Fritz has done, taking that program over, kind of you know transforming it from a one and eleven type football team a couple of years ago to now being a consistent you know uh, New Year six type bowl uh, program for each of the last two years. But I think SMU's figured something out here. I think that this is going to be a higher scoring game. Uh, and this could ultimately come down to which team has the ball last. So I'm going to trust SMU in the upset here. Not necessarily money line, but I think they do enough to stay within the four and a half number. So give me the po- give me the ponies plus four and a half. SMU playing without their starting quarterback in this game. He uh, broke his leg last week. So it, it did make me a little nervous. I wanted to pick that. Um, I still think SMU might actually win that game. I think you might be right there, but I, I need to make up some ground on you. So I'll go the opposite there. Tulane playing at home minus the four and a half with the uh, experienced quarterback here. SMU's got a good defense, uh, so it does make me nervous, but uh, I'll ride the green wave uh, for my uh, for my last pick there and and hope that it allows me to pick up some ground on you because I just need to I just need a two game difference here to take mm-hmm. the lead and, and keep the trophy. Uh, I guess it's uh, a little bit higher on the shelf uh, behind me on yeah. YouTube, but I uh, don't want to mail that trophy off to you here. At I'll, the season, I'll send so. you the shi- I'll send you the shipping label. We'll get that. <laughs> we'll get that thing ready. Adam, last thing for me. Ultimately, the next time that we hop on this podcast, unless just some you know, crazy breaking news, um, you know, comes out of Norman, uh, college football playoffs going to be set. Bowl bids are going to be accepted. It ultimately kind of sounds like Oklahoma and the Alamo bowl. That is ultimately going to be the destination for the Sooners, barring just something drastic happening, ultimate chaos this weekend in conference championship week. Who are the four college football playoff teams when we, I'm gonna go when we record this thing, Georgia, Michigan, Florida state, and Oregon, it's going to be splitting hairs with Oregon and Texas there for, I think, that that final spot. But Oregon having a chance to avenge their only loss uh, mm-hmm. that happened on the road, and they'll avenge that uh, in the uh, neutral site there in Las Vegas versus Texas, who doesn't have the chance to do that, beat Alabama, but I, I don't know what else is all that impressive on Texas's resume. Uh, kind of a, yeah. It's kind of a factor of just the Big 12 not being really all that interesting or exciting. Uh, I, I guess they're exciting, but all not all that highly ranked this year. Well, and the biggest advantage that Oregon's going to have over Texas is Oregon has an opportunity on Friday night to avenge the one loss that they have on their schedule right now. So yeah, I'm going to agree with you. Georgia, Michigan, Florida State at three. They're going to be a sacrificial land for the Wolverines in the semifinal. Uh, and then I think Florida, or then I think uh, um, Oregon rounds things out at the top four. Um, Texas gets left out and we'll go from there. It's going to be fun. We appreciate everyone tuning in this evening. If you were live on YouTube or if you're listening to the podcast later on, uh, we greatly appreciate all that. And we will see everyone again next week for the next episode of the Mainline Podcast.